Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me loud and clear? <laughs> Tonight we're going to be talking about the influence of trade and counterfeiting in ancient Greece. And in doing so, I'm going to be seeking to answer four separate questions. What were Greek attitudes towards trade? How free were the Greeks to trade? How much trade took place in Greek society? And lastly, what was the role of gift giving? So let's start out by considering Greek attitudes towards trade. Those of you who attended my lecture earlier this week will remember the word autarky, meaning self-sufficiency. And to recap, many Greek thinkers wanted their cities to be self-sufficient. They were seeking an economic system so that they wouldn't have to depend on their rivals, and wouldn't have to depend on parties who they may go to war with from time to time. Now, to some extent, this is due to prejudice. You see, citizens were reluctant to trade as this would entail spending time with foreigners and the citizens valued their reputations over and above profits. Equally, the Greeks believed that economic independence would provide political independence. Why was that the case? Well, self-sufficiency would have helped the Greeks in instances where they struggled to source foreign goods in times of war. The Greek thinker Xenophon concluded with an air of principle in his writing that the country itself is responsible for being its own agent, despite him personally supporting foreign trade. So even the people who were pro-trade nevertheless understood the importance of being independent, and that attests to the political climate at the time and the way in which some of these norms were entrenched whether you held one view or another. Indeed, it shows how far-reaching was the support for economic autonomy. However, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, Plato knew it would be, quote, almost impossible for the ideal city to manage without imports. And so if that's the case for the ideal city, you can imagine how difficult it would be for cities that were somewhat less than optimal. During Greek classical antiquity, this desire for self-sufficiency evidently needed to be balanced against competing demands. And that brings us back to our own times, when there are all sorts of opportunity costs and trade-offs because we can't achieve all our objectives simultaneously. Let's turn to the attitudes towards merchants. <coughs> Were the Greek attitudes towards foreign trade consistent? Well, the historian Ingrid Riemer argued that merchants and ship owners alike were viewed as superior citizens for bringing wealth. And Rima uses the example of Xenophon as someone who advocated for the better treatment of merchants. Was this view representative across Greek society? Fewer upper Greeks, up fewer upper class Greeks worked as merchants over time. And that meant that merchants gradually began to be perceived as lower class. And this is unsurprising, ladies and gentlemen because the merchants lacked permanent housing. They lacked permanent housing in a social system where loyalty to the city-state was extremely important. Your loyalty to the polis determined your status, whereas the nomadic lifestyle of the merchants signaled that they were outsiders. And again, if we read the subtext, this is why people like Xenophon are calling for their better treatment. Clearly, because they were poorly treated. And there's an element of class here. Class stereotypes likely 
influence the attitudes of citizens as to whether they would participate in trade as merchants. So if people aren't prepared to go about work themselves, it shapes how they view the people who do go about the work, the merchants in this case. Neither was trade easy, ladies and gentlemen. And let's look at how widely the Greeks trade did. Uh, there was no pressure on Greek cities to introduce tariffs in order to support local production. Uh, they never claimed, for example, in Athens, that Sparta was going to provide all the manufacturing and that Sparta was going to pay for it. Um, so tariffs are really more of a modern phenomenon than something we see at that time. Um, indeed, tariffs could have sparked retaliation from rival cities or distracted city authorities from addressing their underlying problems. That's always the issue with tariffs. If you manage to protect your infant economy, you aren't necessarily solving the problems that make you outcompeted if uh, there are no tariffs around. The city authorities already imposed taxes for revenue purposes, so perhaps they believed this was adequate. And it's for this reason that it's worth considering taxes as a policy that might have struck the Greeks as being too extreme, too draconian. The same thinking applies in the way that a polis approached colonization. The polis was content with owning colonies for military and agricultural purposes. They didn't need the colonies to be trading posts. They weren't looking to maximize their revenue from the colonies. So while economic thinking was always a part of the Greek city-state, that doesn't mean it was at the forefront of how they lived. Nevertheless, there were some constraints on trade. The city authorities limited market penetration from foreigners by precluding them from holding land. This was very clever because it increased the amount of land available to citizens while containing the foreign influence. It also had the cunning effect of making the stay of these foreigners more likely to be temporary and this fulfilled the objectives of the city foreigners, of the, sorry, of the city authorities in preventing any foreigners from becoming a dependent or a fifth column. So they were happy to utilize the foreigners to enjoy the fruits of their trade, but in the main, they didn't want to incorporate them into their society in a permanent way. We do see that city authorities are more welcoming to foreigners when it's in their self-interest. Athen <coughs> sorry, Athenians were permitted to lend money to merchants who were conveying goods to or from the city. Again, we see this reciprocity in how they go about policy. The Greeks also learned to moderate their use of force in general. In Xenophon's view, Athens had lost an empire due to its repressive rule, but regained it by behaving judiciously. So it was neither helpful economically nor socially, if we think of their reputation, to intimidate the wealth creators within the city-state. I spoke earlier about the difficulties involved in work and how citizens didn't wish to do it. Let's look at that in somewhat more depth. Trade depended on what the city-states had to sell. But some of these cities forbade citizens from working in industry. And this meant that the most powerful decision makers never acquired any real experience of the areas they were governing. Can you imagine that of the political class? It also meant that these decision makers didn't have a financial stake in the city's success. So again, we, we see that disconnect between the life of the citizens, intellectual as it was, and the need to manage the economy. And they don't have the experience, they don't have the personal investment. It's no wonder that economics was not at the forefront of their mentalities like it is for us today. In fact, 
the citizens didn't even have much money to spend on enterprise, given the regular taxes they faced, and indeed the expectation that they fund liturgies, rites, and festivals. Of course, today we're expected to fund all of these things and still be investors. Now, the preoccupations that I've mentioned suggest that Greek commercial policy was focused more heavily on immediate rewards rather than on trade and economic development more generally. So I wouldn't want you to go away thinking they don't have a commercial policy, but it is one that is starkly different from our own, reflecting their different values and, more generally, their different social structure. The Greeks even encountered restrictions when they sought to spend their remaining money. As consumers, they needed permission to buy and export timber from Macedonia, even when the export duty had already been paid. And that tells you something about the level of control the city authorities had on their daily lives, how it was normal and accepted. Uh, while this did place the control of industry in government hands, it also meant delaying economic transactions and undermining public confidence. Clearly, people weren't able to make their own independent judgments because they had to rely on government. So we have this irony, don't we, of the city-state being independent, or seeking to be independent, and the people within the city-state, even the most senior wealthy individuals, being uh, unable to ultimately um, enjoy their autonomy. There were also, more pragmatically, restrictions on exporting weapons and naval supplies. And this made sense because rival powers constituted a constant threat and the city-states needed to maintain their upper hand. Perhaps the allowance of those policies in respect of weapons, naval supplies, helped to normalize the practice generally of having a government which was more involved and more restrictive. So once again, you see how economic policy is being shaped more by political than consumer needs. Let's turn then to the question of how much trade took place. And it's in this section that we'll discuss some of the uh, potential counterfeiting that took place in ancient Greek society. So what was the means of exchange in ancient Greece? Barter was the main basis for commerce between different areas of Greek society well into the 4th century BC. And that's because currencies were not accepted widely, except for the Athenian drachma, which you can see on screen here today. And um, those of you who are well-traveled in Greece, even prior to the country adopting the euro, will know that they kept the drachma as the official currency, even into the modern day. Um, not, not the present day, but certainly modern times. Um, so this is clearly an exception, but... It's interesting because it shows that the Greeks didn't oppose foreign currency in principle. Or rather, their use depended on the currency possessing the proper qualities. So what did the drachma have? Well, Athens was a five-thriving center, so the Greeks trusted they could exchange the drachma. And in that respect, Greek currencies functioned on the same basis as symbolic money in later societies. The fact that the drachma was accepted and others weren't as widely traded tells us how fear and trust were such prominent aspects then as they even are today. If we lose faith in a currency today, we remember that it is naught but paper and metal. So there is some continuity, economically speaking, from then to now. We also know that Greek thinkers understood the importance of currencies. Plato described money as a token of exchange, separating its symbolic value from its metal worth. And that is a leap intellectually to go from thinking about something intrinsically to thinking about what it could represent on a much wider scale. Now, even when people weren't trading in barter, it's not as if 
currency was the only means of trade throughout history. Certainly, um, as economies became more developed, you'd see traders using ledger books. And so rather than having a constant back and forth exchange of money, they could keep notes in ledgers, which is another symbolic form. After all, the notes written on a page about how much you owe or, owe some, or, or, or have been paid, that is symbolic too, that is handwriting on a page. So Plato's approach here shows foresight given the limited functions of the monetary system at that time. And now we turn to the counterfeiting I described. So the historian Johann Hazebrook famously questioned the extent to which Greek trade took place at all. And I want to consider and hopefully rebuff three of his arguments. Maybe at the end you can come up and tell me if you were convinced or not. I won't take it personally. <laughs> so, firstly, Hazelbrook contended that Chalcidian swords, Corinthian bronzes, and the equivalent were not made in the cities that they were named after. Instead, he argued they were named after their form, their quality, or the trader's nationality. So, you could be buying a Corinthian sword that didn't come from Corinth. Now, I question that because the spread of these goods across Greece hints at there being at least some inflow of traded goods, if only to inspire their replication. So perhaps you weren't buying um, a Corinthian sword, as the name suggests, but there must have been some other swords um, that had been authentic originally if you were to know of this concept. Otherwise, we have to assume that the manufacturers always traveled, observed the goods being sold in foreign markets, and then returned to make them from scratch in the place where they would be sold, which sounds dubious. The idea that these goods were even copied in the first place beyond their place of origin suggests to me the existence at least of an exchange of ideas, something we might call intellectual trade. And that's a point that I feel Hazebrook neglected in his argument. If the goods were not traded, perhaps their raw materials were. And Hazebrook is on side with this. He recognizes that the name Corinthian bronzes may de derive from the substance that the traders were using. So ladies and gentlemen, the next time you're in one of those exquisite museums and you're looking at some of these fantastic Greek artworks, um, or even practical things like amphora. Um, this is a debate that can run through your minds. So the second argument Hazelbrook makes is that trade faced transportation limits, including difficulties created by sea, as well as land traffic. Now, he's not wrong to point to those hurdles, but they ignore the fact that trade could have occurred over several years with the goods moving gradually between different owners. In much the same way that if you think about things you've bought or things you've inherited from your ancestors, they may have moved over several centuries until finally coming into your family's possession. And in doing so, they may have moved overseas as well, which shows how trade can happen with the same items over a longer period of time. Now, the journeys that were taken may also have seemed worthwhile and manageable for regular traders. So it's easy to discount the challenge, you know, the idea of trade taking place because you have to go by sea. But in fact, if you were a regular trader, then you'd be acclimatized to that idea, wouldn't you? Certainly, the historian Moses Finley advised that we should be careful about applying our modern thinking when we try to understand the nature of Greek trade in ancient times. And lastly, Hazebrook's third argument in doubting the extent of Greek trade is that he says these goods probably weren't bought by ordinary people. But I think that's misguided because poor consumers would not always have been frugal and rational. They may have purchased decorated property occasionally. They might have decided they were buying some pottery which they would use over many years, and therefore the purchase was more worthwhile 
If these points don't fully refute the argument he makes, then hopefully they can qualify some of those arguments. Let's turn then to my favorite part of the lecture today, the role of gift giving in Greek society. And I think this is a wonderful aspect to discuss because it reflects a key nature, the key nature of the culture we're discussing here today. And it's a reminder of how material history, you know, the kind of goods we, you can see on screen, speak to us about what it was like to live in ancient Greece. So what was gift giving? Well, it operated as an alternative to trade among wealthy people in ancient Greece. A gift represented a form of value, even if that value was symbolic. Unlike monetary value, a gift that associated payment with the emotion of an event, be it the funding of a wedding or a religious celebration, could be far greater than the cost of that gift. As we'd say today, it's the thought that counts. A well-chosen gift, plausibly, could be worth a huge amount in terms of the uh, positive associations it generates. And indeed, uh, you need only think of a gift you give someone which then goes on their mantelpiece for several decades and all that gift continues to offer that individual and the social capital it brings if we think about this in raw economic terms. How deeply ingrained was this process in Greek society? Well, misthos means both wage and gift of honor. So for that reason, the interchangeability of gifts and money as payment appears to have been normal. And again, that's an example of how we can use etymology to try to understand today how the Greeks understood the world in their own time. But this process of gift giving was unreliable. There's no guarantee that a gift would be repaid. And while the wealthy minority could have used gift exchange as described, this would have been very difficult for the poor. Again, it, it's necessary to consider the nature of Greek economic developments and practices across their stratified society, to remember that the experiences of one group wouldn't parallel those of another. So now we turn to the question of social elevation in Greek society and consider how that played a part in gift exchange. Wealthy Greeks used gift exchange in order to pay homage to the community and gain influence. This originated with various competitions. Each citizen short, sought to excel at equipping ships and hiring formidable crews. And in the process, they'd be rewarded with a crown. Now, the exchange was therefore motivated by the usual goals of ambition and reward. However, the benefits were gradual and were associated with social recognition rather than immediate payment. Consider the impression you might make on the public, even on the judiciary, by being a wealthy donor. We're now talking about something that money couldn't buy. And so you see the very tacit and cunning role that gift exchange could play in Greek society. You see how a non-monetary system could be more effective for certain purposes than a monetary one. And some of you are probably thinking about the immoral nature of that non-monetary system. But that isn't how all of the Greeks perceived it. Now, the historian Sita von Raiden distinguishes between gift exchange on the one hand and the strict laws against bribery on the other. Public gift giving was a way of circumventing these laws. Perhaps the city authorities underestimated the risk of wealthy Greeks gaining judicial and public influence for true gift giving. Alternatively, they may have approved of citizens gaining influence in such circumstances. In the same vein today that citizens who 
contribute to charity, can receive knighthoods, enhancing their social capital, at least in, uh, in British society. If, if you're someone who's known to be benevolent, it can take you very far indeed, garnering a popular, popular reputation with the press and no doubt creating all sorts of opportunities. So, to some extent, the presence of a non-monetary system, the importance of gaining, one might even say buying, social capital, is something that resonates with our own times. Let's look at the views of Greek thinkers to understand how they perceived this process. Aristotle supported public gift giving. He called it megalopreprea, or magnificence. He regarded it as virtuous. Now, the practice was so important that he saw fit to make recommendations, advising that the money be spent on liturgies and occasions which advance the polis. Again, you see how the polis, the, the city-state, was integral to Greek life. And his advice also reflects how it was ordinary, indeed desirable, for the Greeks to spend money on the community. Socrates, for his part, believed that providing people with service was itself enriching. So you can see how his principles as a philosopher, in turn, led him to these conclusions when looking at real-world practices like gift-giving. Lastly, Xenophon expressed that it would be humiliating to accept more than one could return. And this perhaps explains how the practice of gift-giving worked. If it was only some people that would give gifts, then the whole system would collapse. You wouldn't have a sustained effort. But if you have these strong social values compelling people to give in return, then you see how the system became sustained. And what's really interesting about all of their attitudes collectively is that they reveal an economic system, ladies and gentlemen, where social capital formed part of an exchange. In Greek classical antiquity, social conduct and economic power were therefore intertwined. So, to wrap up the lecture, ladies and gentlemen, let's revisit those questions I asked you initially. What were Greek attitudes towards trade? Well, you've seen how they were variable and how they had to balance that desire for autonomy against the benefits that trade brought them. How free were the Greeks to trade? They weren't taking place, uh, they weren't contributing as merchants themselves in the main. Um, certainly as time went by, that became much less desirable for them. And indeed, there were the restrictions that I described, which made it more difficult. As for the role of gift-giving in Greek society, we've seen how it complemented the monetary system. And we've seen how that monetary system in turn was only one part of paying, given that you could use barter instead. So, the Greek thinkers liked to envisage a city without foreign trade or work, but the expansion of the polis necessitated these practices. There was no clear and logical approach to economic output, because the most educated and wealthiest were discouraged from working, expected instead to sustain their households, give gifts, and depend on slaves. And the contradictions of Greek policy reflect the fact that the polis was less concerned with maximizing output than pursuing its political aims. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, it was quite fortunate that the Greeks traded and exchanged gifts because this was able to signal their wants to merchants and suppliers. As I told you in my last lecture, despite the political focus of Greek thinkers, economic forces found ways to emerge in their usual forms. Thank you very much indeed, and I'd be happy to take questions at the back if you have anything you'd like to ask me.